Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Your Money Momentum with myself, Tom Kennedy, and Kevin Curley. Kevin, today we are going to talk on a topic in regards to life insurance. comes up a lot. Uh, we'll do that. We'll jump into to something or nothing and, and touch on a few market commentaries. So life insurance, where do you want to begin? I want to start with the simple stuff, Tom, which is why do you buy life insurance? So the way I look at life insurance is first reason you buy it. If you, if, if you have anyone who's financially dependent upon you, you want life insurance. So more times than not, that that's children. And there's a, a million different ways you can do life insurance. Some of it good, some of it bad, but everyone's very different and unique in their situation. But let's, let's touch on the most basic form of life, life insurance, which is term. Yeah. So term policies are simple. You pay a premium each year. They give you coverage for a certain number of years. Most popular product that I see is the 20 year term, which happily correlates with what you were talking about, which is the need to uh, cover if something happens and provide for children. The other thing about term that I think is really nice is they've separated the investments from the life insurance versus cash value where it's all together. And the reason that's important is that the term, you're not going to need as much later on because in theory, you're building up your assets. And the reason I like the 20 year, it's most popular it has the best conversion options. So let's say you get to the end of that 20 years and Tom, you're a business owner. Let's say it's gone really well and you have a estate problem. Now you can use that money to do some estate planning for life insurance and you can convert it to cash value at that point. Yeah. Term I think is probably one of the most effective because to your point, it's fixed. So, you know, over 20 years, you're going to have the exact same premium amount. It's the lowest out of all the insurance uh, offerings out there. And uh, you have a set dollar amount, and everyone always asks, well, how much term or how much insurance do I need? And you know, again, it varies. A, a good rule of thumb is, you know, ten times what your annual salary is. So if you're making a hundred thousand, you need a million dollars in in term insurance. Yeah, I think there's a few ways to do it. One, you can look at how much debt do you have. So you can start with what's the payment on the house. You can say, well, what are my future earnings going to be? Well, I think over the next 20 years, I'll make X. So you try and buy that amount or close to that amount. The other benefit of maybe not needing as quite as much as 10 is that life insurance is tax free. So the people who inherit it don't have to pay that 25 or 30 percent federal income tax rate that you're paying on your earnings. So for a lot of people, I think five times would be kind of the minimum. Um, and then you can do kind of the human value um, and figure out what your earnings are and your earnings potential, and what your raises might be in the future and come up with a number that way. Um, I think the other thing to talk about with that is how do you buy life insurance? Um, the easiest way without any health you know, <laughs> challenges is you buy it through work. So most employers offer group benefits. And as part of that group benefits, you have life insurance option. Uh, it's usually pretty restrictive. So you can get one time your salary for nothing. Sometimes the company will buy it and you can get multiple of that probably up to three or four times without taking any medical. Uh, exam. And so that's really important for people who might have something that would prevent them from getting life insurance due to medical issue or an age issue. Um, some of the drawbacks are if it's through work, you're likely unable to take it with you if you leave that job. So you're only covered in the time that you actually stay there and work there. So term life insurance outside of work can be really helpful because you can take it with you. It can be more expensive than group, but part of the reason why is that you can take it with you. It's written just on your life um, for larger amounts, uh, usually above a half a million dollars. There is some type of medical uh, either test or you have to turn over some files and prove that you're a healthy individual. Um, but you can go on Google, Tom, and you can buy life insurance pretty quickly. Uh, you can also work through an advisor. Uh, you can go to one of these companies. Uh, I won't name any of them specifically that only sell life insurance uh, and go to them direct. Some people get it through their property and casualty area. Yeah, that's a that's a good point too with the medical exam. You know, the the earlier, the younger you are when you get life insurance, the, the cheaper it's going to be. As you get older, health issues start to rise, um, and the costs just keep going up. So, uh, if you don't have insurance and, and you're not covered and you haven't done an analysis of what you need, the sooner you do it, the better. 
Um, you know, the one downfall with term is that there's no cash value to to your point earlier. And you're going to make these monthly premiums. And after that term expires, if there's not a conversion option, it's just it's just gone. So you made these you made these payments and there's no value out of it. But it's something that that you need. It's, it's the most inexpensive way to get it. But there's also other types of insurance products. We won't get into all of them because there there are a lot, but there's something called permanent insurance. So. So Kevin, when when would you recommend getting permanent insurance or a whole life plan or something with with the cash value? Because we get that question a lot. Well, you know, if someone talked to me about this insurance vehicle where I can actually invest and the the account value grows. What are what's your what's your take on that? Yeah, it's the most expensive way to buy life insurance, and so the only reason I think you'd really want to own it is if it's the last bucket that you're filling up for planning for retirement or building out your net worth. So, you know, the first buckets would be some of your employer sponsored plans, like a 401k, doing a Roth IRA, things like that, uh, building up a brokerage account. But let's say you've planned all those, you've got pretty good sized net worth. One of the opportunities is you can take loans against that cash value in retirement and loans aren't income. And so you wouldn't have to have any federal income. So it can be a way to lower your taxable income in retirement. But as far as value of tax diversification, it's pretty low on the list, not very valuable at all. Uh, it's a nice option to have, um, but it, there's a lot of drawbacks. So it's stuck in there. It's not easy to access. It takes a long time for you to build that cash value up. Um, so primarily, I think that it can be a, a sleeve of a, you know, six or eight buckets of money that you pull from to create your retirement income. Otherwise, I think the real value of cash value is that you can use it for estate planning. So unlike term life, it doesn't expire. So you just pay your premiums each year. So right now, I think the total for the federal limit's like $13 million. So, you know, a small percentage of Americans will fall into that bucket. But those that do, having that will be important. And you might say, well, how is that important? Okay, well, let's say, Tom, that you own a vacation house that's worth a lot of money and you have a big estate. And, you know, that vacation house, uh, you know, let's think about the Kennedys or the Bush family, right? They're up in Maine. They're at Kenny Bunkport. They're out in the Hyannis. They're enjoying that that land, right? And that property is probably worth, or maybe Mar-a-Lago, right? You got $50 million or, you know, whatever it actually is worth, but something like that. And you want to keep that property in your family. Well, you can't sell that property partially to fund the estate tax. So what you do is you buy life insurance and say, well, when I pass, and I pass this asset on to the next generation to pay the 55% or the 40%, whatever prevailing estate taxes are at the time, I'm gonna have this cash value life insurance and that's gonna pay for it. That way we can keep the house and have all those family memories for generations to come. Yeah, and you know, I'd be I'd be careful when looking at the the whole life policies and the policies with cash value and investments because if you're just making the minimum amount, um, you're typically just paying the cost of insurance, which, as you mentioned, is extremely expensive. So I've I've found those policies work well if you have a significant amount of money to put into them early on, so you can let that money work for you. It can grow in the different investments if. You know, there's different iterations on what those investments look like. Um, you can take loans out against them down the road. Uh, they're outside of your estate and, out, and they're protected from creditors. So they can be a good uh, a tool to use if used correctly. And unfortunately, you know, I, I feel most life insurance policies are either sold or used wrong. Um, you know, there's a there's a saying: the tallest building in every city is a life insurance building because you know they. Tend to, <laughs> tend I haven't to heard make, that one. That's a good one. They, they, they tend to make money, they base it off mortality tables, they know what they're doing, and they bank on the fact that people are, aren't going to use them correctly. So they can can be a useful tool um, if used correctly, but you know it really comes down to your situation, assets, debt, children, estate planning. It's a very, very effective tool. Um, and you know, I, I had an insurance guy tell me that insurance is used in one of two ways, for need and greed. So for need is going back to that term policy. You have children, you want to make sure they're taken care of in the event something happens to you or for greed. If you filled all those other buckets and you have extra money to put away, it can be a valuable tool and resource to, to build your estate. Yeah, I think that's good. Now, Tom, uh, with the cash value life insurance, we've referenced a few times how there's an investment portion of it. I think we should probably dive in and talk about the three different ways you can have that investment account within the cash value policy. Uh, you want to kick it off? Yeah, well, there's, there's, you know, you, you got your traditional uh, mutual life insurance companies that pay an actual dividend. So it's a, it's a guaranteed dividend that's, that that's paid to you more times than not. It's, 
it's more than the actual cost of the insurance. So it's a way to build up uh, build up the the account value. Um, and there's different variable life insurance policies that are directly tied to the the stock market. Different types of investments. There's there's policies called index policies where you have a downside of zero, but they cap you at you know eight or nine percent depending on what index you're, you're following. So there's different iterations and different ways to, to use them and to, uh, to invest in the market. Yeah, I think one thing I'd follow up is, you know, the, the, if you're going out shopping and you're looking at these kind of things, what you'll typically hear is the first thing that Tom called where you get that guaranteed rate of return is called whole life. It tends to have the lowest rate of return, uh, but the highest level of safety. So you're guaranteed that really low rate of return. They're definitely going to give that to you other year. Um, the second part would be the index universal life. So that is going to be something that tracks an index like the S&P 500, or maybe it's a life insurance index uh, that they made up, right? So there's some that they provide and it's a mix of stocks and bonds and they go, oh, it'll be whatever this is. And it's something that they create. Uh, not to say that there's anything scandalous about that. It's just you might not necessarily see the ones that you recognize. But the idea of the, um, the IUL is that you're tracked to the S&P 500. So if it goes up 30%, you might be capped at seven or 8%. Um, but if it goes down, your number is zero. So you just don't grow that year. And if we look at how to stock market does over 10 years, usually two, maybe three of those years is negative, but seven are positive. So how do I eliminate those zeros? Uh, it can be a pretty nice outcome. And so that tends to be your middle road of risk reward. And then the last piece, which was you mentioned, which is the variable universal life insurance, which allows you to basically buy mutual funds within there. So uh, like your 401k at work, there's going to be a menu of options. You're not going to have access to everything, but then you can buy, you know, within that a bunch of small caps, you can buy large caps, you can buy pretty much whatever you want within that menu. Uh, and that risk is up to you. So if you choose, you know, a bunch of emerging markets and they do well, you're going to go gangbusters. And if they don't, well, that life insurance policy cash value is not going to grow very much. Yeah, and, and you got to be careful too when looking at these illustrations because they all look really, really good, and that's what the oh, they're looking incredible. Time. <laughs> and you know, you know that middle option too with that zero percent floor, you don't lose anything. However, what you don't realize is that the account value will still go down because the premiums of the life insurance, which can be very, very expensive depending on, on the policy. So, you know, it, they can paint a very rosy picture, but they can be a powerful tool. And uh, there's that's a good way to describe them. Those those three, from conservative to middle of the road to, to very aggressive, and now you can even add riders like long term care, which you know we all we talk about all the time. Um, so there's they can be flexible, but again, there's so many moving parts, and the prospectus is you know about three inches thick for a reason because there's you know a lot you can and can't do. With this. Yeah, one word of caution when it comes to buying life insurance uh, is I would try to work with somebody who sells life insurance, but also sells other things. So let's say they have access to annuities, they have access to individual securities, they have access to mutual funds, they have access to a wide range of investment products. And the reason that I find that important is that if you only have a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So if you come in and they only can sell you whole life insurance and you go in and go, hey, I got this problem. You go, ah, I've got the solution. I've got this hammer here called whole life insurance. But if you go in and the guy goes, well, I can sell you whole life. I can sell you index life. I can sell you variable life. I can sell you this portfolio of securities. I can sell you individual securities, SMAs. I can sell you, I can do all of it. Then they're going to be less likely. Now there might be some commission motivation <laughs> reasons, but they're going to be less likely to say, yeah, no, that's hammer. They might say, well, maybe the wrench is better. Maybe the screwdriver is better. It's not going to be a hammer is the answer for every question. Yeah. Yeah. And we always run the analysis too. If you were to do term and take the difference, of the cost of doing a whole life or a variable or an index, if you just were to invest that in a, an IRA or traditional brokerage account, you start weighing the options, is is it worth it? And again, it's it's situational, but to, yeah, to your point, I would focus on someone that is uh, agnostic and has the whole universe available to them, typically a, a financial planner that can point you in the right direction because th it isn't for everybody and everyone's different. Yeah, all right, Tom. Thanks for right. talking life insurance, and uh, let's move on. Where are we headed All right. next? All right, let's do uh, let's do something or nothing. So I'm going to throw the first one to you. It's been uh, the topic of conversation this year. AI is it something or nothing? Oh, it's something, Tom. We covered it on either the last podcast or the one two ago where you had a miner over in 
gosh, I can't even remember. Was it Namibia? It was somewhere in Africa. I can't <laughs> and I apologize for being so geographically foolish, but uh, they took all the old maps, uploaded them almost like a large language model that they're doing for the most popular things you see in AI. And they found a mine and it was successful. I think that's tremendous. And I think that uh, I listened to a interview with Ray Kurzweil, who's uh, a well-known futurist. And he just kind of makes the point, the stuff we see now is the worst it's going to be. Uh, it's only going to get better from here. And it's not going to stop getting better. Uh, there's no limit to how good it can get. So uh, whether it's writing stories, whether it's creating movies or finding uh, abandoned mines in far off places uh, that have been lost to history, uh, I think it's tremendously powerful. And the last piece of that would be it's uh, incredibly deflationary. Um, so those productivity increases don't come without a cost. Deflation can be a big part of it. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely something, you know, I uh, bespoke uh, research that we follow, put put a piece out last week and they had a great comparison and they compared it to the uh, gold rush of the 1840s where, you know, the, the real the real beneficiaries of the gold rush in the 1840s wasn't the, the companies that were pulling the stuff out of the ground. It was the picks and shovels. Um, those are the companies that that made the money is supplying the resources to, to pull the stuff out of the ground. And they're comparing that AI is the gold and the chip companies are the picks and shovels. And we've seen a bunch of them, NVIDIA. I mean, anyone that, that any kind of touch on, on, on AI right now as just their stock price has taken off. So whether that, that continues to be determined, but I think it is definitely something it's here to stay and uh, something that we're going to continue to look into and, and, and focus on. All right, Tom, our next one is uh, this shiny yellow metal that humans, for whatever reason, have been hooked on for thousands of years. We're going to talk about something called gold. Um, gold is hitting all time highs. Um, is that something or is that nothing? I think it's nothing. You know, gold has gold as an asset class doesn't work the same way as it as it has worked in, in, in the past through the seventies when you had inflation take off, interest rates and gold prices went up. There's there's this myth that gold prices have an inverse correlation to, to interest rates. And if you actually look back at the correlation, uh, it, it, it's not true. The idea behind gold was that if interest rates go up, gold prices actually go down because now there's more there's more competition like money markets. You can go into money markets that have a, 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 a yield now of five, five and a half percent. So you're less you're less likely to allocate to a safe haven asset like gold. There's also this misconception out there with the price of dollars. Gold is not is denominated in dollars. So as dollars go down, the price of the dollar goes down, well, the gold prices should go up because you have other investors that have money outside of dollars that can have better purchasing power to, to buy the hard asset. You know, gold was trading around 1100 1200 coming out of 2008 and kind of went sideways up until about 2018, 2019. We saw this crazy lift up to about 2000. And we've stayed in this 1700 to we're now at what, 2100, $2,200 an ounce. Um, I think it's a flight to safety trade. If, if all hell breaks loose and we go through a massive crisis, you tend to see this flight to safety and those are bonds and, and gold. But as a hard asset, um, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of it. It doesn't pay a dividend, and it hasn't worked as well for an inflation hedge as it has in the past. So, I think it's overbought. It's actually the most overbought it's ever been um, as it is today. So, I I think it's nothing. Yeah, I think it's kind of something. Um, and the reason I think it's kind of something is that gold is an important thing if you want to maintain your purchasing power. And the reason why I think that is that the government deficits that we had the last few years are astronomical. And this is in a time of, we'll call it relative peace. The U.S. isn't officially at war with anybody, even though we're involved in some things. Um, but we're running $2 trillion deficits. And I think that gold prices going up is really just a reflection of those values going down. And I, it, you know, I compare it to house prices, right? We know that housing in the U.S. for the long term, so over 100, 120 years, uh, tends to rise and fall with inflation. And uh, now it can get off that trend, especially in particular markets. You get developers that do something creative, and now that piece of land is worth maybe more than it used to be. But traditionally, American homes are really nice inflation protection because they rise and fall with inflation. And we can go into all the reasons why, but gold to me is a similar thing, which it's, it's a hard asset. And as long as you have these massive deficits, the U.S. dollar is going to decline in value uh, relative to gold. 
Uh, now, as you said, gold doesn't have cash flow. It doesn't pay a dividend. And I agree as an investment, it should not be, you know, your cornerstone or anything like that. But if you've got, you know, a significant net worth, you know, above $5 million, having a portion in gold, I think can be something worthwhile. But if you have a few hundred thousand dollars, I think you have to buy cash flowing assets. You need stocks, you need bonds, you need some offense because having gold is not going to do you good because gold, as you mentioned, just kind of does whatever it wants. It doesn't follow if there's a deficit like this. It doesn't follow if there's an interest rate. Now, eventually it might trend that way, but for a long time, it doesn't. <laughs> it's just, it yeah. kind of just doesn't work. But over the longest period of history, gold tends to rise and fall with the value of the dollar if price in dollars, right? So if we think that the long-term path of dollar is being less valuable, gold can be something that can be helpful. Yeah, it's interesting to see the dollar ha has ran up quite a bit and gold has followed. So that correlation is breaking down, but it could just be an anomaly. We'll 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 see. Um, speaking of speaking of deficits, though, so something or nothing, the federal government just had a seventy six billion dollar uh, interest payment on its debt last month. Something or nothing. I think this will eventually be something. Uh, I think the problem that we have is that we have way too much debt. It's into the 30s as far as trillions of dollars out. And what's fascinating about it is it was at like five or six trillion only 20 years ago. So we've had this five or six X move in the total amount of debt outstanding for the US. And, you know, we've gotten some good stuff for it, but I don't think we've seen it as much. And we've talked before about the federal budget is just, it's, it's very focused on a few things and it spends almost all the money on those things. So if you didn't have programs like Social Security or Medicare, uh, I think defense spending is a drop in the bucket. I think it costs like a nickel out of every dollar spent. So, you know, if you say, oh, we got to protect the country. Well, we are, but it only costs a nickel. Uh, <laughs> the other 95 cents goes to interest payments, Social Security and Medicare. So, uh, yeah, I think those interest payments, if they continue to balloon and go higher, it's going to be a massive problem. And, you know, what's frustrating is that we have an election this year and there's nobody running for any office talking about it. Yeah, I think um, I think this is this is something, and it already is something. If you look at our 24 federal budget, six and a half trillion dollars, 13 percent of that they're budgeting for 870 billion in net interest payments. We're based on that last number, we're going to blow through that, which is more than defense spending, which is at 890 billion. Um, you know, to your point, Social Security, Medicaid make up the majority of it, but we cannot keep racking on almost a trillion dollars in interest debt just alone. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll paint, we'll bankrupt ourselves. I mean, to put that in perspective, I might have mentioned this before. Remember 2008, remember the, the, the TARP program, the Trouble Asset Relief Program? Mm -hmm. Their, their proposal to Congress was 800 billion to bail out the banks. And they thought they were absolutely crazy. It ended up being a trillion. We're at that just in the net interest alone in our debt. Well, our next one is something we referenced before, which was going into this earnings season. We expected a lot of companies to announce uh, good things, bad things. But the one big change was tech starting to pay a dividend. So we had Meta announce its first dividend payment. I think we're going to have more on top of that. Tom, uh, are dividends by tech companies something or nothing? You know, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's nothing, but. Yeah, I don't think it's something crazy either. You know, these companies are starting to become flush with cash. And when you have a ton of cash, you do a couple different things. You reinvest it back into R&D, expansion, whatever it may be. You buy back shares, which has been going on and, and still continues to go on. Or you issue, you issue it in the form of a dividend. So um, these dividends aren't huge. It is different to see tech companies issuing dividends. But I think that will be a, a, a continued trend and it helps out uh, with with investors and everyone's always looking for, for income and that little bit helps. So, you know, I don't think it's anything major, but I think it's, I think it's something, something to keep an eye on. Yeah, I think it's something as well. I think that it's interesting that uh, previously there was a floated idea to start charging a tax on stock buybacks. And so companies started to pivot and pay more in dividends. Yep. And I think the follow-up to that will be, depending on how the election goes this year, one of the things that's going to happen, uh, not at the end of this year, but the end of next year, is what's commonly called the Trump tax cuts are going to expire. And one of the things that I think will be a big fight in Congress is that preferred dividend rate. So right now you get to get those dividends at a much lower tax rate than ordinary income. Meanwhile, your interest from bonds, you know, traditional fixed income, that gets charged at ordinary income rates. So I think the next fight will be these dividends as they become more popular is taxing them as ordinary income instead of at a preferred rate. 
Yeah, that 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 would be bad. There's a lot of that. There's a lot out there in the proposals, and we won't even get into that. That'll be a different conversation, but um, that could be something for sure. Uh, all right, last one, Kevin. Something or nothing. Uh, CPI print came in uh, earlier this week. It was a little hotter than expected. Is this something or nothing? You know, the Federal Reserve says that it's nothing and they're making progress, but uh, the price action in the markets would tell you that this is something. So treasuries sell off on inflation, on inflation rising. Uh, yeah, that's interesting to me. Uh, I think inflation should cause the treasury yield to go up, and it did. Uh, meanwhile, people are expecting the Fed to cut rates, but the market's saying, no, rates are going to go a little bit higher. Uh, and I mentioned, I think it was two weeks ago when we met, uh, the Bank of New Zealand, the Bank of Australia, that our next move is probably to raise rates a little bit more than it is a cut. So I think if they don't make progress on inflation and it stays at this 2.8 or 3, uh, I think we're going one direction on rates, which is a little bit higher. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's something just yet. We've been going sideways on the inflation print for about the last nine months. Um, and that's normal. I mean, you had nine percent at its peak back in what was it, June of, of 22. So obviously inflation is going to drop off quickly. And then there comes the time where it's going to plateau to get inflation from three and a half down to two and a half is a lot more difficult than getting it down from nine to eight. So mm -hmm. I, I think this is just par for the course. I do not think they're going to raise rates. Um, now, the big question is, is this a repeat of the 70s where we plateau and then inflation picks up? If we start seeing some significant moves upward, then it could be it could be something and, and all bets are off. But I think this is the market reacted actually favorably to it. The stocks rallied and I think it's already baked in. So I don't think it's nothing, but this could be. This is the big 800 pound gorilla in the room right now and everyone's keeping their eye on it. Yeah, the, I thought it was curious that stocks and bonds reacted opposite um, to that news and stocks did rally and bonds sold off and you go, huh, I thought they were a little bit more correlated than that, but maybe not. So anyway, thanks, Tom. This was a good episode. Any bold predictions or anything you want to finish with? We got the March Madness tournament about to start. Get your future freezing cold takes as we launch into our latest series of... Old predictions. Well, I'm guessing I know who you're going to take. I, I don't think you do, because I'm not sure my team is going to be in it. <laughs> well, no, it's not we're be firmly in just outside the bubble. We're like first four teams out. So uh, I don't know that we're going to be in it. So I think my hot take will be uh, something people might be surprised about, which is last year was a year of chaos where we had teams you never would have thought like uh, in the Final Four, like Florida Atlantic, Boca Raton coming to show up. But I think this year is going to be the flip. I think this will be the first year we get four number one seeds all make it to the final four. I think that there's a gap in talent. And I think that after last year's chaos, we're just going to go straight chalk. It's going to be a boring, not all the top seeds win, but the top, top seeds, they go all the way. You know, the first time I look at college basketball is on Selection Sunday when the brackets come out and I'm in some pool, but I know I don't follow it. I never will follow it. It's fun to watch over that couple week period, but I couldn't even tell you who is uh who the number four seeds number the four number one seeds will even be so um i'll, well, we I'll tell you a couple it's going to be houston for you and yukon the fourth one it could be unc it could be arizona there's a couple teams tennessee um buying for that one so we don't know who the fourth one is but those top bucks? three seem to be accepting themselves uh they're bucks? actually in the mix so shockingly it's a good season uh, in football sort of <laughs> not really <laughs> better than it was and then basketball kind of the same deal it's like the buffs are back on the map well there we go i'll be wearing my hoodie uh in two weeks when uh if they're in it so all right kevin yeah. see you in a couple of weeks you've been listening to your money momentum brought to you by global wealth advisors to learn more about gwa and its talented roster of financial professionals head on over to gwadvisors.net Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.